Matthew chapter 23. Actually, go to Genesis 19. I'll just read it for you if you want. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Next topic we're talking about is mercy and the weightier matters. Mercy. Jesus is clear. These ought ye have done, and not left the other undone. In other words, they're puffed up in this. Their, their works, their, their glorying in the flesh was not impressive to Christ. He looked at them and said, "Ye ought to have done the weightier matters. If you're if you're lawyers like you say you are, if you're Pharisees like you say you are, you know you're supposed to know the Bible better than anybody. Ye ought to have done the topics, the ideas, the 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 things in the Old Testament that were weightier. That just had more occurrences, had more value in the Scripture. I believe God purposely places things more regularly in the Scriptures because He wants to reiterate those ideas. So the next one we're talking about is." Mercy. And it was interesting to find out that mercy is even a weightier matter than that of, of grace itself. We think of uh, grace are you saved through faith. And we, we, we thought that perhaps maybe I would think that, that grace would be a bigger topic. It's actually very rare even in the Old Testament, the idea of grace. But mercy, again, 276 times. But we know of grace, and Pastor Anderson re recently preached a great message on grace, uh, where he went into the fact that it's not just God's riches at Christ's expense, or it's not just... Uh, you know, receiving something that, that you didn't deserve or, or those uh, funny ways that we have of saying it, but it's actually just plain as day, favor, goodwill, and kindness. F favor, goodwill, and kindness. Yes, God's riches at Christ's expense has to do with grace, no doubt, but there's, it's, it's more complex of a, of a topic, more complex of a word. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 19 and verse 19, the Bible says, Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil should overtake me, and I die. We here see grace and mercy in the same immediate context. And I take this idea of grace, which, which we see is the second occurrence, but this is the first occurrence of mercy you'll find. And I see that magnified thy mercy is in the context of grace being found. So a magnification of mercy is what grace essentially is. I believe that, yes, by grace are we saved through faith, but I believe that the foundation of it is mercy, the mercy of God. Why? Because, because it is magnified mercy that allows someone to find grace. Um, without mercy of God, which without what He imparts to us as far as mercy, the favor, the goodwill, the kindness is not available to us. Why? Because we are automatically at enmity with God. So God has to be merciful to us in order to allow us to receive of His grace. Just in uh, looking at the Webster's Dictionary definition of mercy, we see that benevolence, mildness, or tenderness of heart which disposes a person to overlook injuries or to treat an offender better than he deserves. The disposition that tempers justice and induces an injured person to forgive the trespasses and injuries and to forbear punishment or to inflict less than law or justice will warrant. In a sense, there's perhaps no word in our language precisely synonymous with mercy. That which comes nearest to it is grace. It implies benevolence, tenderness, mildness, pity or compassion, and clemency, but exercised only towards offenders. Mercy is a distinguishing attribute of the Almighty God. Amen. Amen. God takes His mercy and just gives it to us, be, and it's not even because of anything we have done. He's merciful to us as offenders. We've hurt Him, we've harmed Him, we've sinned against Him, and yet God opens up His mercy to us, and He does it to prove a very real aspect of Himself, that He, in fact, is merciful Himself. Look at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. Many of you know Exodus chapter 20 is the first time we see the Ten Commandments unveiled. And in the Ten Commandments, Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 6, the Bible says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, 
and keep my commandments. So God is a jealous God, and he does visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of those that hate God. So their iniquities no doubt will be visited upon him, but now he extends, or he shows, mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Now, this seems like mercy is only available to those that are keeping the law. I would just hazard that this is a different type of mercy. Why? Because God was merciful unto the people of Israel even up until this point because he's, he's even giving them laws in which to follow. They, they were to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Yes, but now he is essentially giving them ten commandments. And the purpose of these ten commandments and all those that follow is simply to lead them to the grace of God, to point them unto the Christ that saves them. It's simply the schoolmasters. So he's being merciful unto them, understanding that, yeah, they're going to break these commandments. They're going to need my grace. But they're going to need me to be merciful unto them first before they can receive of the good gifts that I have provided for them through grace. John chapter 14 and verse 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And that is directly focusing back to the Old Testament here where it says, Those that love him and keep his commandments receive mercy. We show our love, we receive mercy from God by keeping his commandments. It says in another place, 15 verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. So it's saying the same thing in reverse order. Uh, to abide in God's love means to keep his commandments commandments. And that all is on the basis of the mercy of God. Why? Because in saying keep your commandments, it's just like that blessing and the curse idea. If ye do, ye shall receive. Hey, no one's doing it. No one's keeping God's commandments. No one is living righteously. So God, even in presenting commandments for us to fall short of, is a merciful act to just say, hey, this is what I want from you. Otherwise, we're just out here in the dark. We're wondering what in the world does God want? He was merciful enough to us to at least give us a law. Yeah, the law does reflect on us poorly because we're like, ah, I'm not keeping that. I'm in trouble. I'm a wicked person before God. But hey, what does that do to you? It leads you to the point where you understand, I'm a sinner. I, I, I need to be saved from my sin. I need salvation. And now you're on the path to be saved, to receiving the grace of God. Why? Because God originally extended his mercy to you by telling you what he wants of you. Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 25 and verse 17. Mercy is so important to God that he has a whole, a whole uh, uh, piece of furniture, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a whole implement within the context of the Old Testament sacrifices and the work of the tabernacle. And the, he has a whole device called the mercy seat itself. Look with me in Exodus 25, beginning in verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them. In the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and another cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee above the mercy seat, between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I have given. I, uh, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. I will meet with thee, I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, God says. He makes an implement that we can see. I mean, sometimes it's hard to grasp and understand what God's mercy even means, but he makes a device. He makes a piece of furniture. He overlays it with gold, makes it very ornate, covers it with cherubims, places it upon the Ark of the Covenant. He fastens this in order that he would meet and commune with his people there. And where we meet and commune with God is at his mercy. We have boldness to step before this throne now. But as a picture, God provided the gold, tangible item, the implement that people could come to. And it was between the cherubims. And this thing was brought down to earth, essentially, as Moses fashioned it according to what he saw in the mount. It was brought down to earth in order that the merciful Lord would have a typology, a typological, or however you want to say it, he would have a type of his throne here upon earth. So men could understand. Again, he brings something that's very complex, very, you know, great men of God we find in the Bible when they see the throne room of God fall on their faces. And yet he allows for at least 
a, a small group of people, at least for the priest to see it personally and tangibly, he allows for them to see and to behold what God's throne is like in order that they would come to him and they could have mercy upon them. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 11, the Bible says, God is good and his mercy endureth forever. And 41 other times in the Bible, it says God is good and his mercy endureth forever. Specifically that phrase, his mercy endureth forever. Turn to Psalm 136. Psalm 136. And this is one of the Psalms that's just jam-packed with this phrase that God's mercy endureth forever. So even as God endures forever, even as he is from everlasting to everlasting, his mercy was always an attribute of him. His mercy extends as far as your everlasting life extends. In Psalm 136, 26 times we hear this. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. And I'm going to have a little liberty with the scriptures here, but listen. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters, to him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night, to him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, and brought out Israel among them with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, to him which divided the Red Sea into parts, and made Israel to pass through in the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh, and his host in the Red Sea, to him which led his people through the wilderness, to him which smote great kings, and slew famous kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land for an heritage, even an heritage unto Israel his servant, who remembered us in our Lord's state, for his mercy endureth forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. And even as God's mercy endureth forever, he wants us to show forth his mercy. If you look in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, the Bible reads, Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful. Why? For they shall obtain mercy. Matthew chapter 9, the Bible reads, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. And what a great highlight God makes. Clearly pointing back to the Old Testament. How there was ordinances and sacrifices. And all these great outward shows of the flesh. But he looks back as Christ on earth and says. You know what? I desire mercy more than sacrifice. This is the exact same message he was giving to the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23. He is saying. Your sacrifices. Your tithes. Your offerings. Your givings. Your outward shows. Are nothing without mercy. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. God is telling the people. He said, they that behold me, not as physician, but they that are sick. Go and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. God wants mercy to be placed upon people. He wants us as physicians bringing the good news, bringing the salvation unto people to go forth and help those that are sick of sin. Help those that are sick of their own wills. Help those that are sick and in need of a physician. We bring them to the doctor. And that is how we show mercy. One of the many ways that we show mercy. In, Psalm, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 7, I believe it says the same type of thing. He says, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. In other words, the mercy was this great big beam in their eyes that they were that they had, and it made them that they were constantly condemning the guiltless. They were constantly judging people that were not at fault. They were in in, uh, in they were guilty of a weightier matter that was appointed in the law, that was commanded in the law. They were guilty of breaking that, and yet they were tithing of mint nanas, and yet they were keeping these tiny little peanutty things. Um, and they were just outward showing them the best they could so they would appear unto men to be righteous and they were missing it. They were missing the fact that mercy is what God requires and not sacrifice. In Luke chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 10, the Bible says, Luke chapter 10, in verse 37, 
Luke 10, and verse 37. And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus, Go and do likewise. So here's the story in Luke chapter 10 and verse 37. Uh, there was the Samaritan, right? And we know that he was injured. He was taken by thieves. He was knocked down. He was beaten. There was nothing that he could do to save himself in this situation. He was that one that was sick. He was that one that was in need of the physician. And we saw that the self-righteous Jew walked by. We saw that the self-righteous Levite walked by. And in doing so, they condemned him. They essentially put him away as if he was not even meet to be called a human. He just, he just, they just had no regard, even passing by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And this is the mercy extended on him. This is him giving to that man mercy. He doesn't know him. He doesn't know anything about this guy, and yet he sees that he has a need, and he wants to be a neighbor unto him. So he brings them to the inn. He, he pays the innkeeper to pick up where he left off because he had to carry about what in his business. But this man is taken care of. And they ask these self-righteous Pharisees. Jesus asks these Pharisees. He said, he said, which one was neighbor unto them? And they answered correctly. They said, the one that showed mercy. And he said, go and do likewise. Well, are they to go and just look around for men that are beat up and try to pick them up and try to bring them to... Okay, well, that is one way that they could do it. But go and do likewise is simply contained in that statement where he answers them back. They say, he that showed mercy is the one who is a neighbor. How do you be a neighbor? You show mercy on people. And Jesus says, yeah, exactly. Go and do likewise. You can see how these people probably all the time got tripped up by Jesus. Because even as you're reading this, it sounds like he's answering them back in kind of these dark parables and these sayings. where they it, It's hard to understand unless you're following that Jesus has a big picture point that he's trying to make. And that's trying to prove that he is the very Christ that fulfilled the Old Testament. Trying to pull these Jews away from their religion, away from their works of righteousness, away from their keeping of the law, and bring them unto the law of grace. And in doing so, he takes their words, twists them around on them, and as they answer, yeah, we got it. He showed mercy. He's the neighbor. Jesus says, yeah, go and do likewise. And we too have this same ministry, I believe. We're to go and do likewise. And as Christians, we're empowered to do it even more so than these converted or would be converted Jews would be. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. The next picture of our ministry. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. This is talking about the church now. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. It's even a ministry given to the body of Christ that one would be merciful. And I believe there are people who have a special gift of mercy. I believe that because I've witnessed it firsthand. It's people that are generally merciful, generally compassionate, and they're cheerful when they do it. And I've witnessed this firsthand, but I believe it first and foremost because it's ordained and set forth in the Bible. There are all sorts of gifts. There are all sorts of things, weightier matters, if you will, that are supposed to be a part of the church. And mercy is one of them. Yes, prophecy, very important. Having a proportion of faith, you know, believing in prayer. Ministry, just in general. Teaching, exhorting one another. Simplicity, you know, is, is you can do those things. Giving, right? We all have different gifts, but cheerfulness is how you're supposed to show out your mercy. You have to be a, a merciful person. It says this then in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Judge according to what is good and what is evil, and just cleave to the good. And when you're cleaving to the good, you're going to just exhibit these weightier matters. God is going to allow these weightier matters to be a major part of your life. Why? You're reading the Bible, and as you read the Bible, you're going to say, hey, you know, the tithe's mentioned a few times. I think the tithe is really important in the Bible. But we too often take something like that, and we elevate it to such an importance, and even show out in the flesh that, oh, I'm just giving and tithing and doing all these great things. You've missed it. But then as you read the Bible, you're going to understand. You're going to read about mercy, about mercy, about mercy, about about um, all these different weightier matters. You know, you're going to hear about judgment. You're going to hear about faith. And as you do, you're going to just be 
taken over by, by just how weighty these matters are. And this is the second of them, and that's mercy. I believe it's nothing more than, than giving somebody who does not deserve, who has not earned favor, just exhibiting that mercy unto them and, and being a blessing, even though essentially there's nothing that's going to come back to bless you in return. Dear Heavenly Father,